The winners of the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics were recently announced, and the awardees, Alan Aspect, John F. Clauser, and Anton Zeilinger, basically won it for proving Albert Einstein wrong. Hello there, my name's Parth. Let's talk about the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics. According to NobelPrize.org, the three physicists that won the 2022 prize were given it for experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities, and pioneering quantum information science. In this video, I want to talk a little bit about what some of that actually means. Let's begin by understanding that quantum mechanics is a physics theory developed to understand the behavior of very small things in our universe, and by extension, bigger things that are made up of those smaller things. For example, we commonly use quantum mechanics to understand how particles, such as electrons, protons, and neutrons, interact with each other to make up atoms, which of course make up all of the stuff around us. The thing with quantum mechanics, though, is that it often goes against common sense, and also against all the theories of physics that came before it, collectively known as classical physics. But if that's the case, why do we keep quantum mechanics around? Well, simply because it works. It's excellent at predicting how any system that we're studying should behave when we do experiments on it. In fact, quantum mechanics is better at predicting how the systems that we study should behave than any of the theories that came before it. So far, all the experiments we've done firmly point to quantum mechanics being a correct explanation of the phenomena that we observe. But what exactly are some of the problems with quantum mechanics? Why does it seemingly go against common sense, and what does this actually mean? Well, to understand this, let's first imagine that we want to study the behavior of a tiny particle known as an electron. Electrons are one of the particles that we saw earlier making up atoms. But in this case, we want to simply study how a single electron behaves, moving through, say, empty space, just to make things simple for now. Using the old theories of classical physics, we could say that if we measured the particle's speed and position at some point in time, then we could use some simple equations to predict where the particle would be at some later point in time. Really simply, if our electron was here at x is equal to zero at the beginning, and it was moving at a speed of three units per second, then we could predict that one second later, we'd find it at x is equal to three, because it was moving towards the right. And assuming we had accounted for all the things our electron could interact with, which in this case is, of course, nothing, then our prediction would be correct every time we did this exact experiment, measuring an electron at a time one second after it was found at x is equal to zero, with a speed of three units per second to the right. Fairly common sense, right? Now, with quantum mechanics, every system that we study must be assigned a wave function. This wave function basically contains all of the information that we can know about our system. Specifically, it tells us the likelihood or probability of finding our particle, in this case, at different points in space, if we were to do a measurement in order to find out where it is, just like we did with classical physics earlier. So let's say, for argument's sake, that for our system here, the wave function looked like this. In quantum mechanics, if we take the wave function and we square it, technically taking its square modulus, then this gives us the probability of finding our particle at different positions in space. In this particular case, because the wave function squared has a high value at this point in space, we're more likely to find our particle here when we do our measurement, and we're less likely to find it here, for example, where the value of wave function squared is smaller. And this is where all the quantum weirdness comes in. Quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory. All we can find out is the probability of getting a particular experimental result before we actually make the measurement. Once we make the measurement, of course, we've got the data, we know where it is, there or thereabouts, but before the experiment, we can only predict the probabilities with which we'll find it in different locations. Whereas in classical physics, we could predict exactly what the outcome of the experiment would be before we did the experiment, provided we had enough data about the system. To put it another way, in classical physics, if we did the exact same experiment over and over, we'd get the same result over and over. But in quantum mechanics, supposedly, doing exactly the same experiment would give us different results each time. This somewhat goes against common sense, because we usually 
inherently believe that doing the same thing over and over again, the exact same thing over and over again, should give us the same result each time. In other words then, this idea goes against our liking for determinism or cause and effect, which is the idea that if we know everything we are allowed to know about the system, then we can predict exactly or with 100% certainty how it should behave. Again, presuming we know the rules that it must follow. Now, very quickly as an aside, if we want to calculate what the wave function actually looks like for any given system, then we plug in all the information about it, such as what's in the system and what's surrounding it, into an equation known as the Schrodinger equation. And then we can solve the Schrodinger equation to find the wave function. All of this is not super important to us right now, so please check out this video up here, also linked in the description, if you want to find out more about the Schrodinger equation and about wave functions. But let's now come back to this idea of quantum mechanics giving us probabilities and also the idea that the exact same experiment being conducted over and over could supposedly give us different possible measurement results with us not knowing which result we would get in any particular experiment before we actually did it. Einstein hated this idea. He, along with Podolsky and Rosen, wrote a paper that used the ideas of quantum mechanics to try and find a logical inconsistency. In this paper, they studied a theoretical system made up of two entangled particles. These particles would be generated from a single source usually, and then separated really far away from each other. But crucially, we could say something about these two particles based on what we knew about the source or what came before the production of these two particles. For example, if these particles were made by splitting a bigger particle and that bigger particle initially had some amount of linear momentum, what we normally just know as momentum in high school physics, then the linear momentum would have to be shared between the two particles that were produced because of the principle of conservation of linear momentum. Momentum cannot magically disappear from a system, neither can it be magically gained by a system. The amount of momentum in a system must stay the same if the system is not interacting with anything outside of itself. Now, what we've talked about so far is basically fine in both classical and quantum mechanics. And linear momentum is all well and good, but a more commonly used example is some sort of angular momentum, such as spin. Now, I've made videos discussing what spin is previously on this channel, so check them out up here. One of them is linked there, and also in the description box if you're interested. Basically, though, spin is a type of angular momentum, which is another conserved quantity. Imagine the particle we started with had no spin, no angular momentum. So the particles that come from it also must have overall zero angular momentum. This could be the case if both particles had zero angular momentum themselves, or if they split into other kinds of particles that had some amount of angular momentum each, but they canceled each other out because they had the same amount acting in opposite directions. The overall result of this is that before the system had zero angular momentum and after it still has zero angular momentum. The interesting thing though is when these particles have angular momentum and we try to measure what directions each of those angular momenta is in. For two particles separated by very large distances, we could simply work out what angular momentum both had by just measuring one of them. For example, if we measured this one, and its angular momentum acted in this direction, then we immediately know that the other one has angular momentum acting in this direction. Remember, the net angular momentum has to be zero. And we haven't even necessarily had to make a measurement on the second particle. Now, quantum mechanics said that before we made a measurement, the system was not in any particular angular momentum state. Making the measurement actually caused its wave function to collapse into a particular state. Because remember, the same measurement could give different measurement results, and it was said that the act of measuring caused the wave function to collapse into the particular state that was measured. Whereas classical physics said that the system was already in one state and we just didn't know which one it was in until we measured it. The interesting thing about the quantum argument though was centered on the following question. How would the second particle know that a measurement had been made on the first particle and what state it needed to collapse into? especially with particles separated by large distances. It needed to know instantaneously what state to collapse into, so angular momentum would be conserved for all points in time. 
But then this defied a concept known as locality, the idea that no information could travel between two points faster than light could travel between them, since light is supposedly the fastest traveling thing in the universe. But here we see that the quantum system would need to communicate instantaneously, as soon as the measurement happened, which is of course faster than light can travel between these two particles, and even more so when they're separated large distances. However, classical physics was saying, well, the particles are already in this state, so there was no communication between the particles when the measurement was made, it's just that we found out what state the particles were in. We gained information by making the measurement. For slightly unrelated reasons, this classical argument could be disproved. This video is long enough already, so I won't go into that here, but once again, there's some resources in the description box down below if you want to find out more about it. But the point is that according to quantum mechanics, in order for us to be able to do this experiment and for quantum mechanics to be correct, we would have to break determinism from earlier as well as locality. So why did Einstein dislike this so much? Why did he hate the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics? Well, it's because both classical physics, as well as his two theories of relativity, which had only recently been super successful at explaining the universe on a large scale, relied on the ideas of determinism and locality. These two concepts formed the foundation of his theories, so he wanted quantum mechanics to also be deterministic and local, which is why he thought that the then current theory of quantum mechanics was incomplete without these two foundations. And he, alongside Podolsky and Rosen, suggested a rather clever way in which quantum mechanics might be deterministic and local after all. Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen, or EPR for short, suggested that there may have been some hidden variables that we could never have access to, which basically determined, deterministically, what state the system should be found in at any given time, independently of any measurement that we were to do on it. We, as measurers, would not know what the hidden variables were, or how they worked, or how to get to them, but the system wouldn't randomly collapse into a state because we did our measurement on it. The hidden variable would cause the system to just continuously change over time, however it worked, and we would just simply happen to catch it in a particular state when we measured. This system was deterministic because there was information that determined how the system behaved, even if we didn't necessarily have access to it, and it was local because there was no faster than light communication when the measurement was made. The other particle not being measured was continuously changing and we just gained information about it. The key was that the randomness that quantum mechanics brought was hidden away in the hidden variable. The problem though was that designing a real experiment that could tell the difference between these two possible theories, randomly collapsing quantum systems and local deterministic hidden variable systems was really difficult. However, Eventually, a scientist named John Bell showed that there was some forms of correlation between the results of multiple measurements on many versions of this same type of system, and the amounts of expected correlations were different between the quantum model and the hidden variable model. He showed this using an inequality known as Bell's inequality. Now, this inequality really deserves a video of its own in order to do it justice. I don't want to rush it by shoving it towards the end of this video. So please let me know if you'd like to see a video on Bell's inequality. But this, finally, is where our Nobel Prize winners come into the picture. John F. Clauser took the Bell inequalities and developed them until a real physical experiment could be done to show which of the theories was more likely to be correct. Alan Aspect further improved on this by closing some loopholes that could have tainted the results. And Anton Zeilinger took all of this further and worked on entangled states to understand quantum phenomena such as quantum teleportation. Pretty cool, right? Through the work of these three scientists, as well as others like John Bell, we saw experimentally, over and over, that the predictions for the correlations made by the hidden variable model were violated, and the predictions made by the random collapse quantum mechanical model were more closely matched in our experimental results. In essence, these three scientists won the Nobel Prize this year for proving Einstein comprehensively wrong. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe and hit that bell button for more fun physics content. Please check out my merch also linked in the description below. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote that Einstein made 
when talking about quantum mechanics and how he hated the probabilistic nature of it. And finally, a huge thanks to all of my Giga patrons and all of the others over on my Patreon page. If you'd like to support me on there, that's also linked in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching once again, and I will see you very soon.